The core technology is something that is is misunderstood. Misunderstood because of part of it's misunderstood because of something that I grew up loving deeply, which is like The Simpsons. You know, <laughs> like that. Oh, yeah. like <laughs> people people's cultural connection yeah. to the uh, to the Springfield nuclear plant and. Yeah. Stepping back at something you said earlier, you know, I think, at the, you know, one of the biggest, think of these macro challenges, there's so many of them, but I know one that I'd read and I'd watched kind of the Bill Gates documentary around nuclear, which was really interesting and be curious to what degree you were involved in that project. I mean, that's going to be one of our biggest constraints, I think, over the next number of decades, right? Especially when you look at EVs, everything's happening there. And we just don't have a great grid for that. When you're working with somebody like Bill that has a lot of capital to put to work and he can think, I think, on longer time horizons that most investors would say, eh, um, it's too long. Was that a big part of it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, l listen, you, you're talking about somebody who has tremendous amounts of resources, but also has the intellectual capital, unlike almost anybody else, to understand and um, really deploy things in really creative ways. You know, the nuclear thing is a good example of where we have a, a mismatch between the ambition that we need to have as a globe and the conversation that often shapes the decisions that we make. What the company that uh, that Bill invested in is a company called TerraPower. It's this like phenomenal technology company that is doing really cutting edge stuff, basically figuring out how to remove all of the traditional barriers that nuclear energy provide by making it 100% safe and making it more economic, having there be relatively no proliferation risk, very little waste, like really solving these problems. And the reason why it, it's so important is because unlike renewables, nuclear is not an intermittent source of electrons. So we have a, a technology that has, that's that been proven, like we know nuclear fission can produce lots and lots of electrons. And we potentially are innovating for the first time in 60 or 70 years mm -hmm. with, a, with an application like TerraPower. But then it's really hard. There's regulatory risks, there's customer risks, there's, you know, there's the experience that um, developers have had in building nuclear that have been not fun experiences. There's cost overruns, there's timeline overruns, there's all those sorts of things. And so the question is, are you letting all of those things then say, okay, forget it, we shouldn't do nuclear. Mm -hmm. The juice ain't and, worth the squeeze. <laughs> yeah. Or are you saying, no, those are opportunities for innovation. I mean, that's where you get a leader yeah. like Bill to say, those don't seem like unsolvable problems. They mm -hmm. seem like problems we should solve. And so, but the thing about climate is that is that there's no, there's very few or statements in climate. It's not like we should do nuclear, so then we shouldn't do renewables. No, yeah. we need to do all on the table. Yeah. We need to, we need to put it all out there. We need to allow all of them to compete, but then all of them are going to succeed because we need that many more electrons than yeah. we have yeah. right now. And that's only in the U S like, we're not even talking about, yeah. Yeah. you know, we have access to primary energy that's consistent and reliable and cheap. There is, you know, almost a billion people who don't have that luxury. They need that for not only human survival, but economic development and all of the other pieces of the puzzle that we hope to move the planet forward in a productive way. And so, we're going to really have to have a different conversation about what we deploy, where we deploy it, how we incentivize it. We need to, you know, it is almost impossible to build new power lines. Well, the truth is, is that like you can't generate more electricity and then just have it stay in the place where it's being generated. You need to move those electrons to the people who need it. Yeah. And so yeah. we're going to need to have different conversations about boring topics like permitting and transmission, but the, and it's really super daunting. Like it, it is one of those things where like, if you decide that you want to go into it with a negative mindset, you can easily go down. You're going to go, you're going to get, it's like the, it's like the never ending story where the nothing's going to consume you. Nothing will consume <laughs> you, exactly. I look at it in, in an optimistic way in two elements. And I think that I learned this mostly because I had, again, that great opportunity to spend some time with Bill, who is truly at his core an optimist. And one of the ways is that, you know, humanity has done a pretty good job of solving huge problems in the past. Yeah. There's none that has been bigger than this problem, but we solved a lot of really big problems. And the second piece is that if you break it down into its pieces, we've actually solved already a lot of these problems. We just need to now deploy those solutions at scale. And that's very hard. Like, very, very hard. Very, but we know we can do it, you know? And so that's like a thing that makes me feel a little bit better going to sleep. At One thing you said to me and remind, I mean, remind me of this stat. We were talking about the fear back to nuclear for a minute and the amount of death versus other 
Yeah, you zero. told me some stat that really blew my mind, and I think it hit the point of the head. From a death perspective, the source of electricity generation that has killed the fewest people is nuclear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously, coal and oil have had very public terrible disasters that have cost human life. Um, they've also had coal in particular, but also oil and any kind of um, of that kind of combustion has led to tons of deaths when it comes to air quality and pollution and things like that. Wind and, and solar are way, 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 way down the, the trajectory when it comes to human lives lost. And those are mostly accidents, but, um, but there have been some. But with nuclear, there actually haven't really been any. But, you know, it doesn't mean that Chernobyl wasn't a oh, yeah. horrible disaster. I mean, that was a deep and horrible disaster. It doesn't mean that what happened in Japan wasn't a deep and horrible disaster. It was. Those were often actually disasters at nuclear reactors, but not necessarily disasters of nuclear reactors. And so that's to say in Japan, the problem was there were a bunch of generators that failed because those generators were placed under sea level. And when you have a tsunami, you don't want to place a bunch of diesel generators under, <laughs> under. That doesn't make sense. Level. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Th those generators that were going to continue to power the plant and allow it to cool itself, they were gone because they were, um, they were, the engineering was bad. In the Chernobyl situation, that thing should never have been, that never should have been allowed to be built or operated the way that it was. Mm -hmm. And even at that time, we knew how to build things much smarter and much safer, which is why that didn't happen in the US with our reactor. But there was a bad regulator in the Soviet Union. There was like, there are all of these yeah. other elements to it. It wasn't the core technology. And so the core technology is something that is is misunderstood. It's misunderstood because of, part of it's misunderstood because of something that I grew up loving deeply, which is like the Simpsons, you know, <laughs> like that. Oh, yeah. like <laughs> people, people's cultural connection yeah. to the um, to the Springfield nuclear plant. And yeah. um, so you got to walk around like a third eye. I think everyone's yeah, getting yeah. all contaminated by radio waves. Everybody is. I mean, you know, it works at a nuclear power plant and that there's the there's that green core that goes in. It's like the beginning of the whole show is premised on how terrible nuclear um, power is. But it's really not. And again, I mean, I think that at this point, like what our our job is to especially in forums like this, where, you know, people are listening to a conversation and trying to understand better. They're tuning in because they want to understand better what we're talking about is, you know, we have to overcome some of the lore for some of these things yeah. and move forward in a way that does solve some of the problems, which it does, which we do need to do. Like, you know, there are serious economic risks to the current fleet of nuclear reactors. We shouldn't be deploying. I mean, that's not where we should focus our, our scale in nuclear. It should be in this, like, set of very, very creative technologies that are coming down the pike. And then we should think about like, what are we able to use it for? Are we able to use it for, I mean, one of the really cool things about that particular technology is it's both a generator and it's a storage device for technology. So it's actually a really productive complement to renewable power. And that is a technical innovation. You know, that is smart mm -hmm. people trying to figure out solutions using um, tools that we already have. I mean, it is a uh, a really inspiring kind of a, um, of a journey around something that, you know, people have tended to hate. So, but it's not just nuclear that has that, that, that issue in the climate space. I sure. Mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, all of it, wind, all, uh, there's always some counter argument to it, but I think to your point, if you think of what I always describe, what got us here, and I always blame it on my parents. And, uh, <laughs> you know, cause if you look at the last 75 years, it was a combination of the Alarian effect post-World War II that I think that drove a lot of this change, right? We all moved from cities to suburbs, we got bigger houses, and then we filled our houses with more stuff. And then we got credit came out in the 50s, and then we could buy things faster. And then plastics really boomed in the 60s, and we could store things longer. And then globalization happened, and then e-commerce happened. So the layering effect and the result of all that is what's driving, I think, a lot of this rapid change in our, in our climate. And that took many, many years systemically for that to occur. And I think it's back to your point. It's not, now we got to go the other direction and but we got to try to do it in a way that's at least cost neutral or else I think you get so many headwinds in front of you.